this entitled manager has ridiculous expectations of his workers, demanding them to make travel times that are physically impossible. So when this employee gets told to drive his boss's car as fast as he can, he decides to obey completely and gets some wonderful revenge in the process. Happy birthday, today's your birthday, on with the revamped show. This happened about five years ago. It was my first week in my first real job, Porter at a local car dealership, and I'd pretty much already resigned myself to the fact that my manager was a prick. He was constantly yelling and swearing at me and the other Porters over the smallest crap. He liked to have us spending hours reorganizing the used car lot, then yell at us when the car wash line got backed up, always had us wash his car for free, etc. Anyway, a few days in, he told me he needed me to make a quick run to another dealership, about an hour drive away in good traffic, to do a used car trade. I drive our car over there and drive the traded car back. I let him know beforehand I wasn't very experienced driving on the freeway, to which he replied, Quit whining, you'll figure it out, and wrote me out some directions. About an hour into the drive, I get a call from him asking if I'm there yet, which I wasn't, owing as much to his crappy directions as to my inexperience. I told him I got a little lost, but I should be there soon. He started screaming into the phone. What the frick? I expected you to be pulling up any minute with a brand new car. What the heck are you doing out there? I just told him I was almost there and eventually he shut up and let me drive. When I finally got to the dealership, I started asking around for the used car manager. Nobody seemed to know where he was. After a good half hour of searching, I found him myself and asked him about the used car trade with our dealership. Of course, he knows nothing. I had to get him on the phone with my manager, which landed me a few more what the Fs. They took about another half an hour to get everything figured out. Then it took another 20 minutes to find the car, get it gassed up, etc. By the time we were done, it was prime traffic time, which meant the drive back was going to take at least three hours. I started the car and immediately called my manager back. I told him, I really don't think we should take this car in this condition. The engine light's on, the transmission's slipping. He wasn't having it and told me to, just get the fricker over here as fast as you can. At that point, I was fed up. I hung up and proceeded to drive the fricker harder and faster than I would ever drive a car. When the transmission started slipping, I'd floor the gas pedal to make sure the clutch packs were good and burned. Engine overheating? Floor it. Stuck in traffic? Put it in park and just rev the engine. By the time I got back, the engine was knocking and the transmission was slipping so badly, it took about 10 minutes just to park it. It had problems before, but now they were so obvious that he'd never be able to sell the car to some unwitting sap. On top of that, it was well after my shift, so I just dropped the keys on his desk and clocked out avoiding the storm to come once he got a look at the car himself. I didn't hear much from him for the next few days, but I reckon he learned to listen when I tell him a car's messed up. I also got a bigger than normal check for that week, owing to the extra hours spent driving around. Upper management didn't like that, since I was supposed to be part-time only, but they couldn't really do anything about it. Don't you just love when you get blamed for things completely out of your control? A one hour drive is never going to actually be a one hour drive, unless you get really lucky with traffic and traffic lights. There's always going to be some sort of accident or roadworks that happens that it's going to prevent you from being the actual time you think it's going to be. It's pretty hard to blame the hero of our story for doing what they did when they're getting yelled at for something that's not in their control. So it's like, alright, if you want this car there as fast as possible, I'll drive it here as fast as possible. For a little background, I'm a full-time Uber driver and have been one for over three years. My original Uber vehicle was a burnt orange Suzuki SX4. It was a great little car. To begin this tale, it was a Saturday night getting close to midnight in the Rocky Mountain State. I had received a trip request from a club downtown for a Christina. At this point, Uber gave very little info to us drivers about the ride we were about to get, just the name of the passenger and the passenger rating. No indication on how far or what direction even the passenger was going. So when I arrived to the club, three college girls pile into the car. Are you Christina? Yeah, this is Christina. In a pretty aggressive attitude. Christina, what is your driver's name? The girls pretended not to hear me as I'm asking for confirmation that I am in fact their driver. Ladies, who is your driver? You are. Q. 
cute obnoxious laughing. I laugh along, putting on my customer service face. I may be, but we still have to confirm that we have the right people. I was very adamant about doing this after someone tried to steal another person's Uber one night. Like I said, and your phone says this is Christina. This Kathy sounds like the epitome of an entitled witch. I make no move to leave and after much grumbling, Christina finally confirms that I am who I am. You're up. Now if you're done wasting time, let's go. Yep, I'm up. Sorry about the trouble. I have had people try to steal another person's Uber in the past. This gets me no response and I do all I can from visibly sighing in despair. I begin the ride and this is where I normally would confirm the address, but before I can even read it, give me your aux cable. We need good music. Cranky Anna Cafe. All three girls scream. Okay, here you go, sorry it's not long. I hand the cord to Kathy, which barely reaches beyond the front seats. Wow, cheap. This was said quietly, but in my tiny car, everything can be heard. It honestly hit harder than expected though, because I am a prideful person when it comes to my work. Crunk the music! After she got the music playing. I'm about to comply when I actually read the address. It was 123 Dad's house, Wichita, Kansas. I obviously don't know the address. Hey, just to confirm you need to go to 123 Dad's house, Wichita, Kansas? The girls are laughing and promptly ignore me as I drive slowly along. Excuse me, I need to confirm the address real quick. Kathy cut me off. Yeah, it's right, just freaking drive! Turn up the music and go! At this point, I just shut up, turn up the music and start driving with purpose. I ignored most of what they said in the back seat at this point. I knew that they didn't want to go to Kansas. They had no luggage and I picked them up from a club, but they told me to drive and refused to listen, so I was going to get as much out of this trip before they would notice that we were driving east at a rapid pace. It was about 40 minutes later that the back seat had quieted down. Uh, guys, where is he taking us? I start to slow down now and turn the music down a touch. We are no longer in a city, but in the plains, and basically only the stars as light. We could still see the city behind us in the distance. Where are we? You could hear the confusion in her voice. Where are you taking us? 123 Dad's house, Wichita, Kansas, is the address you put in and the one I said at the start of the ride. That's my dad's house, not mine. Turn around. Yes, ma'am. I turn around more aggressively than necessary. Where to? Kathy explodes into a stream of insults, drowning out anything else in the car. Me speaking up. Christina, what address am I taking you to? Kathy quiets down, glaring at me, allowing Christina to tell me they are at the college outside of downtown. Let's get you all there, I say, and then crank their music again and start driving. The whole time I am driving, I am in a panic because I just know that they are going to try and contest this fare and probably try and get me suspended from the app. Nothing really eventful happens while I'm driving, but I can hear them say small comments about reporting this and how it was messed up. As we approach the college campus, I began to try to cover my butt. So I just want to say I'm sorry about this experience, y'all. It really sucks when there's a miscommunication on this level. I will say though that I will be saving my dashcam footage from tonight in case there is any trouble with Uber over the fair since it is a strange one. I pause to see if they have anything to say about my dashcam bluff, but they say nothing. I come to a stop close to the dorm area of the college. I hope you'll have a great night now and good luck with your studies. They all get out of the car without a word and slam the doors. I pull away and rate Christina with a single star and give the reason as wrong address entered in and rude. The ride would have been close to a minimum fare if they would have put the right address in, but it turned into a $70-ish trip. Christina never gave me a low rating from what I know because those are the ones we drivers actually hear about. I now know that I could have done a lot different to avoid the situation, but at the time I was still fairly new and it took a bit for me to adjust to the work. That was a good call with the dashcam bluff. I would not have been as quick-witted. You're really stuck between a rock and a hard place as the Uber driver, right? They're not confirming the address for you, so it's like, well, I may as well just do what they say and drive this really long drive. I should get a good payday out of it. But if it's not the right place, which it likely isn't, then if they contest it, I don't get any of the money and I might even get fired. I'm not usually one for malicious compliance, but a few months ago we got a supervisor who's just a jerk. He shifts all his work onto others and then complains about how hard his job is. Let's just call him Gary from here on out. My work operates two sites about 30 miles apart. 
Being in security, we are responsible for both sides. Last night, one of our night shifts guys up and quit due to Gary's never-ending BS. And as Gary implemented overtime restrictions, there was no one to cover the shift, which meant Gary had to, as the contract requires, a minimum amount of staff at all times. As part of the night shift, one guard is required to drive over to the second site and do a routine patrol three times during a shift. Gary, of course, decided he wasn't done with his BS and made the executive decision, I told you he was a jerk, who says that? That rather than wasting time driving between both sides three times, one person would drive over and stay there overnight. This, of course, was a bigger waste of time as there's nothing to do but make sure the building is secure. You just need to check doors and fences which leaves the rest of us a man down for all the main site's duties. So Gary decided he'd be the one going to the second site and wanted to sign out a work vehicle. Gary of course decided that since he wasn't officially on the gatehouse duty, I would have to do the checklist and sign the vehicle out for him. As I went over the vehicle, I noticed the tank was low, so I checked who previously signed the truck out and lo and behold it was Gary, because of course it was. Now our work vehicles are all propane powered, they were not factory made like this and were instead converted. The conversion left the old fuel tank and fuel fill points in place. I'm sure you can all tell where this is going. So I went and got the book which tells you exactly where and how to fill the truck up and try to hand it to Gary. Gary asked, WTF is that? And I begin to tell him that it's to show him how to refill the vehicle. But he cuts me off insisting he doesn't need instructions for the most simplest of tasks. I asked Gary if he's ever refueled one of the work vehicles before, to which he replied, I'm sure I'll manage, and he pushes the book aside. Now I could have easily just interjected and told him how to fill up, but I decided, screw it. I had it with his crap. I very slowly started going through the checklist, item by item, starting with the ignition switch. By the time I got to tire readings, Gary yanked the checklist from me and signed off on everything, including that he had read and understood Autogas Refueling Procedures Booklet A and told me to open the freaking gate. So I did. I never saw or heard from Gary again for the rest of the night. Honestly, I thought it would just be a bit of inconvenience. He'd be unable to work out how to use the autogas pump and he'd have to call me or one of the guys and ask for instructions. I actually forgot all about it by my shift end, but that was not what happened. I was called into work before my shift today for a meeting as the security manager wanted to know how it came to be that Gary ended up stuck on the side of the road out of gas after he pumped 26 gallons of gasoline into the old tank and drove off and somehow didn't know notice fuel pump indicator light on the dashboard until the truck sputtered to a stop about 10 miles from the second site. The union rep had my back which was great and Gary has been given some leave after he was informed he would be paying the cost of the fuel and the tow. I didn't intend for a minor bit of malicious compliance to end up this serious but two weeks without Gary is going great. You'd think when it comes to fuel, you know, the thing that runs the car, that you'd pay a little bit more attention. I guess Gary just assumed it'd be like any other car. Didn't really care. Just thought it was some sort of red tape or formality. Well, Gary had to learn the hard way. He literally put himself in the situation. Every decision he made put himself there. And that's what makes malicious compliance so sweet. I have the same birthday as my mother-in-law, and since my wife and I got together, we celebrate it every year together. They plan it all, and I just tag along or drive for them. This year, my mother-in-law invited her brother and his family, wife and son, to a lunch at one of the big malls here in my country, an hour drive from where we live. Since it is the weekend, traffic and parking is a real pain. I managed to park near an entrance to the mall, which is really hard to come by. With perseverance and patience, I found a parking spot which isn't too far, probably 100 meters by rough estimate. The frustrating part of the parking lot system in that mall is if you go out of it, you will be led to a one-way street, meaning you have to go around the mall to go back to where you were parked. That is why I was glad to find a parking spot that is as close as we could get to the entrance. After doing all the celebration and wandering in the mall, we all decided to head on home because we were all just tired from the walking. Mother-in-law's sister-in-law went out first and as we followed her, she told me that it would be better if the car could be at the entrance already. I told them that we parked not far from the entrance and that it would be time consuming to drive around the mall just to get to the entrance again. She told me that she's going to tell mother-in-law that it is the grandest idea to have the car at the entrance. Cue malicious compliance. 
I said, okay, and walked to the car. They can actually see me getting in the car and driving off. I went out of the parking lot and started driving to the busy one-way street. After five minutes, I got a call from my mother-in-law asking where I was. I told her that her sister-in-law told me to get the car to the entrance. She went silent and just said, okay. After roughly 20 minutes in the darned one-way alley, I got to the entrance. No one was smiling. Parked as close to mother-in-law's sister-in-law so she won't be walking up to the car. Got out of the car and opened the door for her and closed it after she got in the car, which I do not do normally and drove back home. The drive was silent. I am dead tired and I did not feel like it is my birthday today. I went out of my way and exerted effort for that sweet, satisfactory, malicious compliance. Getting some malicious compliance is always a nice little birthday present. If somebody's the driver and they know the local area, chances are they're not just being a jerk, they're trying to make the best decision possible for everyone. And in this case, it cost you having to wait 20 minutes because you didn't want to walk a short distance from the entrance to the car. Submit your story to be read on the channel at voiceyhearstories at gmail.com and join our Voicey Veteran community at r slash voiceyhear. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode. Alright Voicey Veterans, I'll see you in the next one.